All right, we are beginning to talk about um, torque this time. So this is the angular part of forces, and a torque, that's the angular analog to force. So as we get started, let's look at our angular stuff. And let's look at our tangential or linear stuff. So angular stuff we have theta, omega, and alpha. Tangential stuff we have x, v, and a, <clears throat> where x is um, the radius times theta, V is R times omega, acceleration is R times alpha, and again tangential is the operative thing, so we're talking about the uh, perpendicular velocity to that radius, the perpendicular acceleration to that radius. Um, then we talked about moment of inertia and its relationship to mass. This is rotational sluggishness. This is just sluggishness. We talked about uh, angular momentum. Okay. And then for uh, we had linear momentum. Angular momentum was I omega. Linear momentum was MV. Now we're going to talk about the new thing. Torque. Torque is a tau. That's what that symbol is. And force. Now we know force is equal to mass times acceleration. Torque follows a very similar rule here. Torque is going to be um, mass times acceleration. Torque is going to be torque is going to be I alpha. So force is a push or a pull. A torque. is a twist that causes um, angular acceleration. So a torque is force oh, wrote that wrong, sorry. A torque is a radius crossed with a force. Um, or torque is RF times the sine of the angle between the radius and the force. So let's consider something laying on a table. So this is a top view. So we have F1 pressing there, F2 pressing there, and F3 pressing in that direction. Now this is a pivot right down here. and the length of this rod is L. <clears throat> so, torque 1 is going to be equal to force 1 times L over 2. So it's the force times how far away we are from the pivot. Very simple. Torque 2 is equal to the force times, sorry, force 1, force 2, times L, because it's a distance of L away. And torque 3 is equal to 0. Force 3 cannot cause a twist. Only tangential forces cause torque. We are only interested in the right angle part of everything. That's what all of this is about. So we are only interested in the part of force that is perpendicular to the radius. That's what we're about when we're talking about torque. 
Um, the things that apply for Newton's first, second, and third laws for linear cases apply for Newton's first, second, and third laws for angular cases. Namely, for the first law, the angular um, velocity of an object remains constant if the torque is zero. Uh, the second law, <clears throat> angular acceleration, well, that's the second law for torque. And then the third law, for every torque, there's an equal and opposite torque pushing in the other direction. So, <clears throat> quick little note. We just got done saying that the change in momentum over the change in time was equal to the net force acting on an object. So if the net force is zero, momentum is conserved. That works the same way for torques. The change in angular momentum over the change in time is equal to the net torque acting on our system. If the net torque is zero, then the angular momentum is going to be conserved. Let's look at a quick example uh, because you're going to be doing stuff like that. And it's going to be an example that uh, might make you mad. So let's say we have a table. We have a pulley. So we've got mass one. String attaches to the pulley. And that attaches to mass 2. Um, let's go ahead and say the surfaces are frictionless. But the pulley has moment of inertia. That's equal to 1 half the mass of the pulley, m3, times the radius of the pulley, squared. <clears throat> if that's the case, well, let's look at our free body diagrams for everything. Okay. Now, we know that if everything's frictionless, this system or this mass is going to accelerate this way. This mass is going to accelerate down, and that thing's going to twist with an angular acceleration alpha. So let's look at our free body diagrams, see if that tells us anything useful. So M1 has a tension acting on it. It has M1G pulling down, and it has a normal force pushing up. That's it. Pretty straightforward. Mass 2 has gravity pulling down, a tension pulling up, and that's it. Now, this is accelerating this way, so tension has to be, well, tension has to be there. This is accelerating, sorry about that. This is accelerating down, so M2G has to be greater than tension. And now we've got this pulley. Well, the pulley has a tension pulling back and a tension pulling down. I think at right angles to that pulley. It also has you know, a force acting, and it's not, I'm not going to talk about it because it's not a torque, but it has a force acting in this direction that's holding it. It has gravity acting down. We don't care about those they're small. Now, we know that thing's going to have to spin. If the pulley accelerates, and we're saying it does, let's call these T1 and T2 just so we don't be, get confused. If the pulley accelerates, T1 cannot equal T2. And, in fact, looking at what's going on, uh, tension 2 has to be greater than tension 1 in order to make that whole thing spin. Each tension is perpendicular to the radius, so it gives me a, a full torque. So the torque here would be T1 times the radius of the pulley, and the torque here would be T2 times the radius of the pulley. This torque must be greater than this torque in order to get the system to accelerate. So that leaves us with a problem, because usually over here we'd say, all right, M1A is equal to tension 1. And from this we'd say M2A is equal to, oh, well, M2G minus tension.
But these two tensions are different, so we can't just add them together and cross them out. So we have to look at something else. So from this, we get the sum of our torques is equal to I times alpha. And my torques are um, tension 2 times the radius minus tension 1 times the radius. Uh, this torque is in the opposite direction. It would cause a spin in this direction. Um, this torque is with the acceleration. It causes us to spin with it. So, I have to find some way to put this in here to get rid of both of these things. Well, it's not written in a really nice way, and I don't have acceleration uh, over here. So, here are the things we know. We know that alpha is equal to acceleration over the radius. That's real helpful. Let's plug that in. So, oh, oh, sorry, wrong pen. So, I times the acceleration over the radius is equal to T2 times R minus T1 times R. I have acceleration in here now, but I can't get rid of T1 and T2, which is an issue. So we also happen to know the moment of inertia of our pulley. Let's plug that in. 1 half M3 R squared times A over R equals tension 2 times the radius minus tension 1 times the radius. One of those R's goes away and then these go away and I'm left with 1 half M3 times the acceleration is equal to T2 minus T1. Now I can add these together. M1 plus M2 plus M3, oops, sorry, M1 plus M2 plus 1 half M3 times my acceleration is equal to, well, T1 and negative T1 go away, T2 and negative T2 go away, and I've got M2G. So the acceleration of this particular system is M2G over M1 plus M2 plus one half of M3. So that is our acceleration now. Notice that it's different by this factor of one half of M3. That's what happens when we have a pulley that has a mass. There are going to be a couple of problems like this uh, tomorrow that you're going to look at. They should be doable with this information. If they're not, then you can always watch the next video.